Good morning and uh, today is uh, 4th of uh, November and we are going to go to the Kenyan uh, PhD Association. The time now is 11.30 and I'm in Elte which is near the museum called near Astoria and uh, this is the building I should go to.
know there's eight foreign aid, mm-hmm. but mostly in my humanitarian aid. Please feel, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Jumbo. I'm Jumbo. My name is Deborah Kangai from University of Chevron. I study a PhD in management of the National Sciences with a strong bias in tourism management, particularly mountain tourism and sustainable development. And uh, I'm a member of the committee, so maintain your cup, there is more beverages, there is more snacks. So if you feel like you want to do some biological teas, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay, I think already introduce myself, but uh, maybe I'll just repeat. My name is Dahako Ali from the University of Page. So I'm um, second year uh, student, at PhD student at the Faculty of Health Science. Uh, specialization is reproductive health. But as I've already said, I have some of the bias towards maternal and child, child health. So I was part of the team, also part of the teams that we have been organizing with our, our girls doing some catering. So I think by the end of today, we will get the stomach will be full and yes. satisfied. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, my name is Monsieur Kamurama. I am from the first page. I study PhD in regional development. I have bias in uh, finance, regional finance, and so, uh, so uh, public finance. And uh, I served you in the 2023, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, financial year as a dosa and so thank you for that opportunity. And I serve in this, uh, this area by, by actually being uh, part of the team that, that actually gives uh, support to our, to, our, to our community. So thank you for that opportunity that I served. Thank you, thank you, Thank you, my name is Sebastian Lunga. I'm part of the committee. And uh, I think more will now speak later. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I will introduce myself. Okay, okay, I wanted to introduce him, but he okay. has jumped the gun, so I need to <laughs> Okay. All right, uh, my name is Wycliffe Aboga, and uh, I'm from the University of Perth. Uh-huh. <laughs> University of Second. <laughs> and uh, I am an authority in economics because I'm proud of myself. And I specialize in labor economics, uh, particularly issues related with income inequality uh, for gender. So, gender income. I'm also an authority in development economics and uh, macroeconomics in particular. And uh, in this committee, I've been your secretary, trying to pass the different messages and information to this group trying to coordinate uh, the activities between uh, the committee and members. And I have been privileged actually to serve you and uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity. But again, I would like to also thank Bana Mudama because the idea of us having this association came from Mudama when he was the North ambassador and uh, he's the brain behind this. We realize that we are so many of us Kenyans who are international PhD students from different countries, but in particular Kenyans, but we never had an opportunity to come together the way we are coming uh, uh, right now and even just exchange ideas and know uh, each other uh, in different fields. So, Dana, thank you. And your council, being an ex official member of the coordinating team, has been of great significance and importance. Uh, and on behalf of the team, uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for our team. And uh, because I'm the chairman and they asked me to give authority to start the meeting, I say the meeting is official. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, uh, when she's here, 
we are the law senior president. So the authority also for Salah, so you're most welcome.
Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Daria Bardina. I'm ambassador of Russia here in Hungary among PhD students and DLA candidates. And also I have been coordinator of mental health working group for more than two years. To say about myself, I'm a senior PhD student at LTA University in the field of education. Fifth year and hopefully I will graduate soon. Thank you. Small and medium enterprises, and it was really nice to hear about all the different variety of fields here. And looking forward to, to meet uh, you in person. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian. I am from Brazil. I'm a Brazil representing my country here. And I just want to mention that I'm really happy to be here. I met these two guys. Uh, around, <laughs> it's already laughing. But in the last two years, we, are, we have been collaborating in different things in personal and professional uh, environments. And I'm really, really happy to be here to meet you all and being part of this community. Being invited to this event is really nice. I'm really excited to, I don't know, see what's going to happen here <laughs> and, how, and to see how our future to see. The, one of the main parts of those is supporting the PhD students to support, support the PhD candidates and in some sense we are supporting ourselves too because we also want to finish everything. Uh, yeah, just thank you very much for the invitation and I really hope to meet you guys better soon. I think it's time to say after love. No? After love. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'm Firas Shri uh, from CAS. Does ambassador for PhD uh, students. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I'm doing uh, my uh, PhD in English linguistics. This is uh, my third year. Uh, I'm also part of the working group, like one of the working groups in uh, DAS uh, organization, which is uh, related to in integration. So we organize some language events, uh, fashion shows, and some integration, uh, you know. Uh, Events. So I hope to see you again in, uh, in the future in these events uh, with the help of Sebastian because we are in the same working group. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And before you leave, uh, we must teach them our culture. Just one word in our culture. And uh, the best would be Jumbo. 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 Good. <laughs> Hello. 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 I'm from Syria. I'm doing my PhD in uh, food sales, my second year, uh, my, third, my, my third year. Uh, my uh, special field is uh, nutrition and uh, uh, food bioengineering. Uh, and I'm also uh, uh, in the department of uh, medical and health science. Uh, in those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So allow me to introduce or welcome to introduce to introduce themselves, I need to welcome the Global Shuttles community in Budapest. Uh, I don't think I have, have words to express my gratitude or my happiness, but uh, you'll see that as the time goes on my face or my action, I'm standing here with the happiness because of the support and the work they've done to make us who we are today. And the person whom I'm inviting is also my mentor in my projects. So I've really learned a lot from him and even the event for today has really played a big role. And like I said, I don't have words to express this, but just allow me to welcome uh, Juan so that he should also now be able to introduce his team. And that so please let's clap for everyone. Traditionally we usually have a, a song for the visitor like from Kenya. Yes. Sure, sure, sure. 
appreciate you with your visitors. <laughs>
Kaiza uh, from one of our colleagues, Daria. And uh, during this time, you can take more uh, beverage of right there. And also for those of us who have not uh, registered, you can go ahead and do registration. And then it's also time for us to like uh, reach out, start reaching out to uh, everyone of us here in terms of maybe knowing better from him or her in research. So, Zaria, welcome. Thank you so much. So, if you're part of this event, also networking, and to get to know each other better, so we can make new friends and some collaborations for future research or some event um, activities. I have prepared for you human bingo. Does anyone know about that? Anything human bingo? Yeah. <laughs> so today we are going to get to know it later on. Also, for example, you can use it as an energizer somewhere for events. So each of you will get this small table and you should get and get to know other people a bit better. For example, who can play a musical instrument? And when you get to know, you put a name inside. And the, the goal of this uh, table, you have to collect the first. So the winner is the person who collected all names, and it should be all different people, okay? And uh, for example, Sebastian, sing me your favorite song. Next person, as a funny So later on, you should uh, keep in mind what is the song because we will ask you, please, what is the favorite song if you fulfilled all the names? So now I'm going to fastly distribute all this paper with the help of Sebastian, and I hope you have a pen so we can start this. <laughs> May I may ask, what's your name? My name is Deborah Kangai. Yes, PhD student, of course. I study at Stockholm University. Yeah. I am in my second year. Uh -huh. uh, PhD in management and organizational sciences. That's great. And my specialization is tourism management. Oh, wow. So you want to go and move uh, Mr. Ezekiel Mutua from his seat? And uh, or you just want to make policies which will help the country? Sustainable development, and of course, you know, it cuts across the environment. And I see you're doing an amazing job as uh, in, in the, you know at this position. And uh, once you want to say here, you have set it up very well. People are enjoying. I see them just coming back and back. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much. Uh, hello. We are happy when people are happy. Kamisa, Kamisa. But it's of uh, importance that we have got relevant people to share with us relevant information. And from it, uh, we can learn and pick something. 
And therefore, at this particular point, I would like to invite one of the invited guests who is not uh, a student, but uh, an entrepreneur and a person who is in the labor market. And if you talk about the competitiveness uh, in the labor market in terms of the skills, because ideally we have got the skills gap matching the kind of education you receive and what is required in the labor market. There's a gap in between. And therefore from him, we'll be able to know maybe what does the labor market demand from us once uh, we graduate. And therefore guys, uh, I welcome Ronald Gala to give us uh, a brief presentation about competitiveness and skills in the labor market. Uh, let's welcome him. <laughs> Um, good afternoon again. So I realized I didn't quite say my name earlier. I think I was probably a bit tense hearing all those, you know, um, information from the academicians. Kind of bit. Somebody can shake in the boots if they're not in the category. But it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my name is Ronald Ngalamaina, and uh, I was in, I came to Budapest. I work with UNICEF. UNICEF is the UN body uh, tasked with. Um, supporting children worldwide. And the area of focus is, uh, is education, there is sanitation, and hygiene. Uh, but I am particularly in the area of human resources. And I've been in human resources right now for about 15 years, um, in and out in different agencies. As you realize, there are several agencies within the UN organization. So I have worked briefly with uh, Population Fund, with World Food Program, and most extensively in the last five or so years with UNICEF. I have been as a HR practitioner. So I, I began basically uh, not from HR, but my qualifications were not necessarily in the area of human resources, but they were general commerce, and that captured several aspects of this management organization, etc., etc. So um, when I was asked to speak, I know it's a very short time, but I tried to see how relevant I can be to us today. I began. Uh, with my work, I've worked probably under, I've worked under about 10 managers in the last 20 years or so. Um, and each of them, these managers have got specific skills. As, as varied as they are, so diverse is how they are. And they come with different personalities, for example. But the question is, is that they have got one particular common um, denominator, which one they have to fulfill or meet their targets at the end of the day, isn't it? And that is why they have hired me in the first place. I remember one time when I was, um, of course, during the time one of my first, about the second job I was attending, and my supervisor was actually a, a retired army officer. And this was a sales job. And the sales job required that you have to meet your targets, isn't it? So at some point I was struggling quite a bit, you know, and you know, every month you must get four targets, it requires you must meet perhaps X number of people, but there's so many things happening at that time, to the point whereby I was not quite meeting my targets. So this is what he said. He's saying, I'm going to remove my heart and make a decision. What that meant is that I do not care what you're doing. I do not care where you are right now. I don't care whether you are sick or whole. I don't care what your family is. I will remove my feelings rather, okay, and make a decision. So. Perhaps some of us have gone through that kind of a scenario, I'm not sure. But you could find um, these experiences out there. But the question is this, so he didn't get to find out perhaps that time I was, uh, had an ailing father who was terminally ill, that I was, had a very young family, but they have got four kids right now, the eldest is in university, and three others are here with me and my wife. So at that time they were very young, you know, and it meant he didn't get to think, what is this guy going through right now? Is there anything that could help out to maybe help him do better at the time? But those words really cracked through me. But for some reason, I have this kind of calm demeanor. And I remember when I was finally leaving that place, I explained uh, what really happened. So eventually, let's get back a little bit. Um, eventually, my parents, my dad passed on, okay? And that was just about a, a day before that, he had determined to, to terminate my contract. What did I do? So, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, my dad passed on just a day after he made that statement. 
and I was determined to go back to him the following day. Very early in the morning, he goes, he's an army guy, very disciplined, he's in the office, sharp by five, he's in the office. So I had to go there very early to see him and tell him, kind of to plead my case out and say, by the way, you know, this has happened, could you just, you know, uh, give me another chance. So because my father passed on, the human side of him came alive, perhaps, <laughs> you know? And that was the reason he called me back and had another chance to continue working. Of course, you know about the post election violence, that went on and eventually I had to resign. But now the question that I had in my mind, right now, if I was in his position at that time, as like now I am the manager and I'm looking at Ronald and I'm trying to advise Ronald, how would I possibly talk to Ronald at that instant? Now the things that, to, today there is so much drive to achieve targets. So much, to the point whereby we forget that we are working with human beings. Perhaps you would have asked me, hey Ronald, what is really the problem? Is there anything I can do to help you perform better? Can I probably go out with you in one of these um, ventures, you know, as you meet your clients, so that I can go to see what are the areas that you're falling short? Is it perhaps your presentation skills? Is it perhaps, you know, uh, maybe how you're dressed? Because as a salesman, you can imagine, you've got to be sharp. And I was selling insurance. And you're not selling necessarily anything tangible. So what the clients are buying, literally, they're buying you. So if I go there with a torn or a kind of a, should I say a tired suit, and like my friends, uh, colleagues, you understand that, if we go there and I don't have a, my pen has to speak on my behalf, you know, my shoes have to be polished, and if I go there all smelly, then I've lost that business. Perhaps that was the area that I was struggling with, and indeed, it could have been. Perhaps it was literally my performance that was low, all right? And all these factors are true, but perhaps what would have happened should my boss say, come Ronald, let's go have some coffee, okay? Let's see what you have, what the problem is. I realize uh, you mentioned last time your dad is not feeling well. How is he doing, all right? Are your children, are they in school? Do you have, do you have transport back home today? You know, sales job will depend on yourself totally. Even the client going to the cafeteria, you have to pay for that client. At one time, I remember going to a, a Java shop and I remember a cup of coffee that time was costing 240 shillings. You know, and that's probably about all I had in my pocket for that time, <laughs> you know. So you're meeting a client and literally you are barely having anything to go back home to. I mean, even transport itself was a problem. So perhaps if he called me and said, Ronald, do you have fare to go back home? Or how can I support you for these few days? Maybe that would have made a difference and I would have opened up and probably I would have received the help. Or he suggests perhaps, uh, do you want me to, to, to link you up with a, with a, with a counselor? You know, or with somebody who can help you or a peer, somebody you're free with to discuss these issues with, to help you out. Because these are real issues, folks. These are real issues. And sometimes managers overlook this. You're in the job market right now. If you're one of these managers, and then this staff member comes in, the first impression is that this is basically a low performer. And that is the over, that's the kind of over aching judgment that we give. This one is a low performer, and I don't think they can actually make it. But if you go a step further, just to find out how are you really doing and being human is basically choosing to be vulnerable you're saying i'm opening up yes um and perhaps it's much easier for the ladies and for the men to be vulnerable but you're simply saying i'm unable at this point i am failing at this point i cannot make it at this point i need help all right and that is the position that we need to be as managers. Now, if you flip side, if you flip the side, you who's going to the job market, what do you need to do? Now, I can promise you, being in HR and particularly in the in United Nations, we look at qualifications one and secondly, experience. Now, you ask me, when do I get experience? I've been studying my whole past five, six years. You know, so how do I start? All right. Now, you could start from whatever. Is. It does not demean, now, being human again is saying, it does not demean you by starting in a position that does not quite define who you are, all right? For example, you're in a doctor position, but can you start as a support staff in an organization where they are doing medicine or like in a hospital? Can you begin at that level and then grow in the ranks? Now, and the growth in my experience working with all these managers, a lot depends on how then I relate with those around me. The skills that you have acquired will not diminish. You have got your papers, they are there. Many times I, I, I fish it out, 
hey, it is, it's a PhD, all right? But then behind the PhD, who is behind that PhD? Is it a person? Is it a, is it a robot? Today we've got the AI coming in, in in full force and perhaps threatening our jobs as well. But it's my opinion that the human side of you has got to come out and that is what shall determine, shall give your boss or your supervisor the impetus to see, can I promote this gentleman or this lady because I see a skill in her or in him which would help my organization to grow. Because you're dealing with human beings, isn't it? You're not dealing with machines. And much as we may try to have all this technology coming in, the AI, the first time I was seeing chat GPT, I got almost terrorized, you know? You put in a question and bam, in 10 seconds or less, it has given you all the options you can imagine. You know, so it's easy to, to, do, a, to do a thesis or to do a report today, it's very, very easy. But the question is this then, does that mean that's where we all have to go eventually that we, we, we kind of dive in into AI? I say there's a part for that, but also there's a part for the human skills that must also come, come up. For example, we can strive towards efficiency, which is important, very efficient, you know, technology-wise, everything we have. There are smart cars today, you can just sit in and they can drive wherever you are. But what if technology fails? You know, perhaps it, they don't fail. But what if that 5% of technology fails? What happens? It can only work out if there's a human behind that to kind of step in. Today, there's so much unpredictability in the days to come in terms of weather patterns, in terms of uncertainties, there's wars breaking out. And in a two weeks time, a whole nation like the Middle East can literally be grounded through the hall. So all that has, has been built over time, literally, can have been raised down. So what happens? The human person must step up, must come out in that sense, showing the empathy, vulnerability, and choosing to support your peers. And that, friends, I tell you, is important for you to rise up in ranks. I want to confess before you that I'm not a PhD student, all right? But then, my rising up to the ranks, I've served as a support staff. I have served as an officer. I have served as a national staff, and I've served as, now I'm serving as an international staff. Not because I am very qualified, but because, you know, in all humility, it's the skills that, I suppose the grace of God has been endowed upon me. I'll finish by saying this short story because I think I've already spoken too much. I was working in, a, in an office somewhere in the Middle East, and, and I was due to, my contract was due to come to an end, but that meant that I do an interview, even though it's within the same organization, okay? So this interview, I, I, was, I was called for the interview, there were many other candidates, also within the organization, okay? So I was called for this interview, and after the interview, I was called by my, uh, the head of the office, and he told me, Ronald, you are not the best candidate. In fact, you did badly. <laughs> All right, but this you you have been here with us. We have seen you, and we would like to give you a chance. Okay, so and that really it broke me down. Literally, I I didn't imagine because losing the job for me was the stakes were very high. I'm here with my family, four kids, guys, <laughs> four kids, my wife, and the only one working. He tells me, ah, so, um, we'll just give you a chance. And what really, uh, really uh, warmed my heart is when he was finally leaving that organization to a different office, he said, Ronald, it is your attitude that made the difference. Because you, were, you, were, you accepted correction, you received that correction very well, and because of that, you have, been, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have seen a trajectory of increasing or improving on your performance. And that really won my heart. So, in a very, I, could, I feel I've got so much to say, but the time is brief. But again, just in a nutshell, that skill that you have, do not let God, not be like my boss who said, I will remove my heart, <laughs> you know, and then take a decision. I've got to really put that heart there. Put yourself in the shoes of this staff member. Or even yourself, God, they realize this boss, even as he's being harsh, perhaps he has got certain issues that he's dealing with. All right? So keep, be patient with your boss. It does not mean they have to become nasty, but it means that therefore can I also be vulnerable and say, boss, uh, I'm here, do you need any help? I realize that uh, it's been a difficult week for you. What can I do to support? Anything, any extra work, can I stand in? And so on. So the skills that will really prepare and propel you to, to prepare, in my opinion. Okay, thank you very much, and I wish you well. Thank you.
so much, Ronald uh, Vigala. I think let's appreciate him well. Especially when it comes to the issues of publication and uh, research work, that we need to have mental capacity to go through those challenges. And here we have one of us to talk about it. Welcome, Peter Mukai. <laughs> Hello. Uh, good morning. Eh, afternoon. Eh? Good afternoon. To receive Jesus Christ. Salam alaikum. Mambo. Niaje. Praise God. Oh, good. Ah, oh, see you have my name is uh, Peter Mokaya. All those stories they've been said, so I don't want to repeat myself. So I'm happy to be here. And whatever I'm going to talk about is not scientific, it's just a, a conversation about the experiences I have had in my journey. And uh, I hope it will be relevant to us. So I will start. Uh, by telling you a story. There is this great guy who was born in Austria. He was born in 1905. And actually, he went, he died in 1997. This guy uh, grew up as a normal teenager. He went to school in his high school. He actually pursued philosophy and psychology. As he was going on, um, next slide, please. Yeah, I'm talking about this guy. So as he was growing on, um, he did um, uh, he studied psychology and philosophy, and he went to Vienna School of Medicine. Uh, he studied uh, medicine. He completed his PhD in 1930, and then he started working. And you remember 1930s, those are the days when there was Nazism, anti-Semitism in Austria. Then this guy is a Jew. He was born in a Jew family. His father was a Jew. His father was working as a, as a civil servant. And then they were captured by the Nazis. Was taken to concentration camp somewhere in Terenciens. It's called Terenciens that camp. There his father died. Then they were taken to another camp. In, the, in that camp, his mother died, a switch camp. Then he was separated with his wife. He was taken to another camp. He was taken to a different camp, and the wife was taken to a different camp. The wife was pregnant. He was killed in, in that camp. His surviving sister managed to escape, went to Australia. So this guy, uh, is the only person who survived and his sister and he worked in a camp and he saw many people suffer he saw many people die he saw many people face atrocities and from there he he came up with a theory on how to support these people which i'll talk briefly after maybe uh, at the next level then there's another woman there I'm not come, I did come to preach, but many people can can relate with that picture. We hear a lot of stories, so don't take it as a religion thing, but I'm, I'm trying to relate to mental health. This lady here is portrayed as the mother of Jesus. There are many good stories told about her and how she brought her son. But she's a good example of those people who suffered. Because you are told you will get a kid, then you are a virgin, but you will get a kid. You get a kid, then there's somebody who wants to kill that kid. You have to move all the way from Israel to Egypt. Israel to Egypt is 613 kilometers. During those days, I don't know whether they had roads. We don't know. We don't know how they moved. You can imagine how holding a, a young baby from Israel, going to Egypt, trying to to escape the wrath of King Herod. So, 
Eventually they came back. He took the kids to, I think, to the temple. And then when they were coming back, the child got lost. Then, this woman here, we are told about the story of crucifixion. Uh, his son was accused of just calling himself the king. Then, he went before the judges. Those people who accused him actually were his colleagues. The colleagues of Jesus, we can say the chief priest was a colleague of Jesus. So they accused him. So he went before the judges. He went before, before who? Uh, Pilate. Pilate was a, was a governor and a judge. We can say so. Then they said he should be crucified. After that, he had to carry his own cross. So if we come in today's context, it's like carrying your own coffin. Imagine carrying your own coffin in the head, knowing that today, after like three hours, you will be killed. And there's nothing, your mother is there watching at you. There's nothing she can do. You are a mother, you are seeing your son being judged unjustly, facing the death, and you can't tell the police because the police are the one who, who want to kill him. You can't go to the court, you can't go to high court, you can't go to supreme court because they are the one who said he should be killed. You can't go to masses. You can't, I'm with you Adamana because nobody is on your side. So in this side, but if, if the system fails, you demonstrate. So as a mother, you can't even convince people to help you to demonstrate because they have also said he should die. So as a mother, you can imagine the pain that mother went, went through uh, in the journey of his son. And you are there, your son is being killed, is being nailed on the cross, is being speared, and there's nothing you can do. So you can imagine the mental state of that mother, how she was feeling, that mental state. So that forms today's uh, conversation is um, all these stories they've been there before. When we come, when we talk about mental health, these issues have been there before. Injustices have been there. We've been, we've all faced injustices. If if you are facing injustice. Those people who were in the concentration camp, their only sin was to be Jews. Was that, was justice done to them? They are missed just being, by being a Jew, then you should die. So those injustices have been there. So whatever you are facing, it is not new. People were there, they faced it, and they came out of it. Victor Franca, all his people died. All his people died, but he came out strong. He was released in 1945, and he was a psychiatrist, and he went ahead to form um, a therapeutic technique called logotherapy. Logotherapy means uh, you help somebody to see a meaning in life. What is the meaning? Why are you surviving? Once, once you know why you are surviving, once you know where you are here, once you know your purpose in life, then there's nothing that can pin you down. You can, you can come back. You can create the resilience. The resilience is the ability to come back. So all this, it, it depends on how you look at it. Injustices have been, has been there. Then all this, the heartbreaks, like some of us, we are here still, there are, there, there are problems at home. Our parents have issues for those who are, of us who are privileged to our parents. And some of them, their issues are affecting us. But remember, the issues your parents have, they've survived long before you. Uh, uh, um, it's unfortunate that last year, early last year, I lost a friend. And this friend 
died because of alcoholism. And he was a great friend of mine. We grew up together in the same neighborhood. We went to the same primary school, same high school, same campus. Then we were working, we were colleagues. So you can imagine how close he was. But uh, we lost him because of alcoholism, because of stress. And the things, one of the things that was stressing him was the problems at home. And the problem that were at home were their parents, his parents were, were not in good terms. And it was really affecting him. Eventually, he went into alcoholism. We tried to support him, but it was not, it was not possible. I actually even paid counseling for him. I carried him there, but it didn't work. One of the things is because he did not agree from himself that he had a problem. So the first way of the treatment is to accept that you have a problem. First of all, you have to sit yourself down there, know that you have a problem. From there, we can support you. All anyone can support us. But if you sit and you deny that there is no problem, we cannot uh, uh, help you. Another thing. Some of us I have interacted with us is we are being overwhelmed by the challenges back home. We are Kenyans, so I'm talking from the Kenyan context. The Kenyan context, if you are the firstborn, you are the assistant parent. Yeah? If you are the firstborn, you are you are subjected to what we call black tax. Yeah? You are here, you are studying, you are the first one, there are problems at home. So, you feel like you are overwhelmed, you need to support your siblings, and some of us, those who go to church, you are always put in WhatsApp groups, you have to support, somebody is doing a wedding, somebody is sick, you see. Those challenges will always be there. And if you put your soul, your energy and everything in solving problems at home, I tell you, you might face the challenges of completing your studies. Because even if you die today, life's smash it and If you die today, life will go on. So some of the things we, we must ourselves into, sometimes we need to sit down, reflect, and see whether we are able or we are not. Because it is within you, it's within our, our powers to choose what we can do and what we can help. But if we oversubject ourselves to black tax, oversubject ourselves to what is happening back at home, uh, tutakuwa tukifanya kazi kwa ma factories na tusahau kufanya uh, kusoma and then you see you see the the, the i have put there the, the glasses eh? you, when you go outside and you put the glass on so the perception changes but have you changed the environment the environment is the same so if you remove the glass the perception also changes. So it's the same, the way we look at problems. The perception, the attitude, it, it will give us energy to, to address them. Next. Yeah. I see, you see those photos there. We can recognize at least one person. All of us, eh? At least one person. At least one person. You see all those people who are there? Yes, it is her. You see those people there? At one point in time, they suffered serious mental illness. They suffered a lot. And they had to agree that they have issues. And they sought for help. 
So even presidents, prime ministers, they face these challenges. They had issues, but they were, were great leaders. You can see there Abraham Lincoln. You can see Martin Luther. Who else? Mahatma Gandhi. Who else? Frank D. Rosenfeld. Who? Rosenfeld. Rachel Shebesh. Who else? Muhammad Ali. Who else? Churchill. Winston Churchill. Good. And in that picture, actually one of the guys succumbed to, to mental health. I don't know whether we can recognize the guy. One of them actually committed suicide. Who? Here? Is he in this picture? No, he's not here. Can you recognize Kenyan? This guy is a Kenyan, the other side. Eh? This guy is a... Uh, who? Professor? Eh? Ah, Kimpigio Makofi. Yeah, that is Professor Abel Mugenda. He's a professor. And this is a great guy, a great researcher. And all of us, we must have read his book and his wife, eh? the research methods. Eh? He's a great scholar, but he was not able to address his mental disturbances. So it is not, when we talk about mental health issues, it's not for them. You know, it is highly stigmatized. Eh? It is for them, not us. But you know, sometimes mental illness is about your mind bullying you. Sometimes you are not able to command your mind. It, it commands you. So all of us, we are vulnerable to these things. There is no one we, we can say that he, in Yaule Mutu, we all get disturbances. Next, please. Ah, wow. That's why I'm saying now, we as PhD students. We need to enjoy life. Let us enjoy life, despite the fact that we face disappointment. Some of us, eh, you write a journal, you send it to the, to the editor, and then you get, you, you get a very big regret. They say your work was so good, uh, it is promising, however, you see that however, it puts you down. But remember, you are not the first one to get that regret. We all get those regrets. The, 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 the difference is how you perceive and how you take it. I think, I don't know whether it's uh, Einstein, you say it. Uh, I have failed like 100 times. I have tried to light the bulb and I have failed 100 times. But I have learned 100 times on how the bulb cannot light. So it depends on the perception. So it happens. Application, some of us, I, I have worked in the, in the NGO for some time. And one of our work we do is fundraising. I've done fundraising. And you write a grant proposal which is like 30 pages. You write uh, day and night. You do a lot of research. You do meetings. You translate then you send to the donor. After waiting for about three months, you get another, another big email. When the mail starts, we received over 300 applications. Know that that thing of yours did it go through. Don't, you don't need to finish. <laughs> so these things happen. Regrets are always there. We, we've done a lot of regrets. But it depends on how you take it, whether you learn or not. Because I have a, I have a cousin of mine. She did um, something dealing with the logistics. And she applied for a job. She, did, she put a lot of effort in applying for a certain job uh, at uh, JKI in Nairobi. And she got a regret. From that time, she has never applied for any job. 
She has never. Now she, she's a housewife. The, the husband provides and she's okay. She said we did all. I tried to apply but I didn't get. So she gave up. But you see, if you don't apply, the answer will always be no. I have a brother of mine. Eh? This is a, a true story. Um, he was really trying to get a PhD. He tried, he tried, he used to get regret, 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 regret. So he said, I think I need to, to maybe apply for, if not PhD, then master's, a second master's, to give me more base. He applied, applied many universities and he failed. And then he gave up. So when he gave up, he went to his advisor. He has a very good advisor in one of the great institutions in Africa called African Population and Health Research Center. So when he, he, he told his mentor, you know, uh, these things, they don't work. But the mentor told him, you know, my, my friend, if you don't apply again, the answer will always be no. no. So he was re-energized re again. He started applying. He applied. After three applications, he got an admission at Hebrew University. So these things, it's about persistence and how you take it, whether you learn from failure or you just go down and sleep. All these things, tunapatanga rejection, academic failure, you've paid a lot of money, our great presenter said here, he has students. But sometimes, you are a parent. They did KCP the, the other day. Sasa akipata 150 marks, utafanya nini? What will you do? I keep at 150 marks and you take it to a very good school, an academy, and the guy is scoring 150 marks out of 500. So he has tried, yeah. It depends on how you take it. Some of us, that thing will kill us, it will sink us down, but some of us, we were not best. When I was in class one, I was position 24 out of 24 when I was going to class two. And that's a true story. <laughs> okay, but by the way, do we define mental health? We don't need to, you know, we, we do not come here to have a, an academic talk, but those people, the, the WHO, we say the, the, the UN people, they have big English, they say mental health is, they say health. Is the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of infirmity, stroke, disability. So, if you are not mentally well, you have no, uh, you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are not healthy. All these things, we need to be aware of this concept, and depression is real. Depression is real and especially in college students. When I was checking the statistics, and uh, in your statistics are USA and in Abatikana. What makes you happy? Are you happy today? Will you be happy, happy tomorrow? Will you be happy after tomorrow? If you get your source of happiness comes from the surrounding, then that happiness is not sustainable. If you are happy because you attended this event, then that happiness is not sustainable. Because if this event doesn't happen tomorrow, so it means where will you get your happiness from? Where will you get your happiness from? If the happiness is your girlfriend, if you meet her, that's when you are happy. So if she leaves, what happens? Life, uh, happiness derived from the outer environment it's not sustainable, it's not stable. So we need to just sit, connect, go inside, and get happiness from within. Can you invoke the positive energy from you, from yourself, from the inner you? So, uh, uh, thank you. I had something, Yamu. Yeah. He studied uh, international political economics in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. And I've been living in Hungary on and off for the last uh, six years. 
And um, there's a couple things I want to talk to you about today, but the second one will be during the upcoming panel and explains the reason why there's some nice cookies in front of you. So hopefully everybody has had a cookie so far, but uh, I'll uh, not reveal my secrets yet and build up uh, curiosity for, for later. So I'll start with talking to you about the global shapers. Um, I'll just a small correction. I am not the, the, the leader this year. Uh, I was uh, two years ago, or a uh, valiant leader is Zina, right there. <laughs> so um, I'm here just in the capacity of being a, a member of the hub. So um, let's try to make this more dynamic. And what I'll do is I'll uh, bend the rules and control my own presentation. So what are the global shapers? The Global Shapers are an organization that belongs to the umbrella of the World Economic Forum. Some of you might have heard the World Economic Forum before. It's an organization which uh, groups together leaders of the world from politics, business, NGO, and other fields to talk about the current state of things and the challenges uh, that face our world and which direction do we want to head towards with regards to the future of labor, the future of government, the future of our climate and many other topics, and the Global Shapers is the vehicle for the youth to be involved in that conversation. So the Global Shapers is where exceptional individuals of all backgrounds and nationalities uh, from the ages of 18 to 30 join to not only discuss these topics that are being discussed at the World Economic Forum, but most importantly, bring positive local impact to their communities. So in essence, we think global, but we act local. So uh, the program was founded in 2011. There's more than 400 hubs all over the world. I guarantee that every single country that is here has a Global Shapers hub in their cities. Typically, it's in the capital or the major cities. Um, I encourage you to, to check us out, to look us up. So, it's a huge community of now more than 10,000 people from all over the world. It's a great network, and we do many projects to benefit, again, our local communities. And that's exactly why we're here today, uh, because we have something that we want to propose to you. So just to give you an idea of our hub, sorry, I skipped that part. We've been here in Hungary, you only are in Budapest, even though we have shapers uh, from our base in different places. Um, for example, we have people from Pitch, we have people from Seged, Ben said we just stepped out, but we do meet in Budapest where we mostly operate. So uh, we did leave our website here, if you're gonna go check us out. Um, I'm sure Sebastian can change, uh, share the presentation later, you can take a quick picture. But I'm just gonna walk you through some of the things we have done in the past, and then I'm gonna focus on what we would like to offer to do together with you if you find it to be valuable. So just very quickly, some of the things we have done in the past. So um, for us, it's very important to talk about the topics that are discussed in the World Economic Forum, um, most importantly in Davos, a yearly conference in Switzerland where many of the global leaders um, get together to discuss the future of the world. We try to bring it to a local context. Here, uh, it's an example of a, well, I guess the screen is a bit cut off, but it's an example of a series of podcasts that we did with experts on the topics of also mental health, economics, um, I believe also climate change. Uh, we've also organized projects in Hungary where we donate books to orphanages and to uh, children in need. We also do workshops on entrepreneurship. So in this case, uh, since I'm Venezuelan, we picked the Venezuelan community in Hungary. And uh, myself, I'm an entrepreneur. So together with my uh, colleague, Metze, who just stepped out, we did a full day session on teaching everything you need to know about starting your business in Hungary if you're not Hungarian. Company types, taxes, free resources, subsidies, um, all of that is available. So uh, if you're curious about this, uh, please come find me. I'm friendly, I promise, I would like, and I would love to share this with you. Uh, we also cooperate with other hubs. In this case, just one example, uh, we raised awareness for, for Europe Day. It's a day of civic unity, civic participation, um, to spread awareness of being European and being in the European Union. And uh, we also do visits to ambassadors in Hungary, and we try to meet leaders of different uh, segments of, uh, 
uh, Hungarian civil, political, and business society. So CEOs of companies, politicians, uh, people who hold influence in the country to understand how they think and how they influence the local landscape that affects all of us. So this is a bit of background about what we have done. And now I would like to tell you what's our idea about what we can do together. So obviously uh, everybody who is a student, it doesn't matter if it's undergrad or PhD or whatnot, asks themselves a the question. What am I going to do after I graduate? Oh my God, it's coming up. Um, and in the case of Hungary, we've uh, paid particular attention to one program, which in my personal opinion, it's, I think it's fantastic. It's Stipendium Hungaricum, and I'm sure many people here benefit from it. And I think the Hungarian government is doing a fantastic job of bringing so many talented people from all over the world to Hungary uh, to continue their passion, um, to gain more knowledge. The challenge, though, is that even if you come here in Hungary, invest so much money on getting you here, then, then it's a challenge to find a way to then stay in Hungary and to perhaps repay uh, the favor, repay the support that Hungary has given uh, so many students. Uh, from a perspective of what would make sense for Hungary would be to have you, many of you stay here, become active, valuable members of society, pay your taxes and uh, bring some investments back that was spent on the program. And um, that's precisely what we're going to try to help. Because the government can do everything. A lot of times, civil society can help instead. In this case, civil society can be the global shapers. So we propose is very simple. We want to start a project with this community, not just uh, Kenyan students, but every PhD student that's here or represented here by a friend, wherein we want to take up to 50 participants in this project on a first-come, first-served basis. And we would like to help at least 20% of those 50 people to find the next stage of their career in Hungary after a period of four months. How are we going to do this? The Global Shapers has 20 members, a bit more, a bit less, who are experts, talented, passionate people in different fields. We have knowledge, we have experience and we have contacts. So we want to help you prepare your CV. We want to help you find the relevant groups where you can't find jobs. We want to help you make your LinkedIn um, more visible or make your LinkedIn more exciting to recruiters. But most importantly, we want to introduce you to the people who will help you in the next stage of your career. And I think this is the most important element that I'll speak from the perspective of myself being an employer. I've probably hired more than 50 people in my life. And to be very honest, if I have two CVs, two resumes in front of me that look very comparable to each other, candidates with similar skills, with similar profiles, but one candidate is recommended to me by somebody I know or I trust, and the other candidate I don't know, who do you think I'm going to choose as an employer? I, admit, I need to minimize my risk. Doesn't mean that the other candidate is worse, but I don't know who he is or who she is. So networking is one of the most, if not the most important skill that you have to leverage in your life and your careers. It doesn't matter if it's in Iceland, if it's in Hungary, if it's in Kenya, if it's in Algeria. The more people you know, the more friends you have, the better. So that's our proposal to you. If this sounds interesting and you would like to participate, I invite you that you send us an email with your interest to this address. You're welcome to tell your friends. You're welcome to tell people you think would appreciate this opportunity. However, I do remind you that we're doing this on a first come, first serve basis. We're all volunteers, and as much as we would like to help everybody, we have to do what we can. So the first 50 people who email us will receive a form, a Google form. Julia and Ayu are the leaders for this project. Julia's right there, and Ayub's right there. So uh, they'll most likely be communicating with you and supporting them, as well as every other member of the hub will support them as well. But this is our commitment, this is our pledge to the international PhD community in Hungary. This is how we can help. So, I thank you very much. I hope to meet many of you, and I hope that you can meet many of us. We'll try to be here towards the very end. 
and um, we'll continue later during the panel session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuan, for that uh, wonderful presentation and uh, an offer to members here. So colleagues, I understand that we are running behind the schedule. Sorry. Okay, the email.